morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. I am Nancy Ellis, a pastor, and I am overjoyed, uh, as always, to be here, but I'm very tired. We had a super, super busy week this week with our Lenten services, uh, I mean, the Ash Wednesday service, our luncheon. Beverly, thank you so much for the soup. And I even ventured into making uh, some soup myself. It turned out pretty good. But we had a great time, and then of course we had uh, the funeral, funeral, funeral services yesterday for Mary Dame, and it was a wonderful celebration of life. And for the first time, I got to see this church packed. I mean, well, not up there, but to see lots and lots of people. So I imagine you guys saw lots of friends and people that you hadn't seen in years, right? All right. On to our Black History moment. Today is Sojourner Truth. She was, an uh, she was a former enslaved person and she spoke out against injustice. Her real name was Isabella Bomfrey, and she felt strongly about speaking out about what was right that she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. Bomfrey was born an enslaved person in New York State around 1797 where it was legal to enslave people until 1827. When she was about 20, she ran away to a nearby farm or family who didn't believe in enslaving people, and they brought her to freedom. She became an energetic speaker at religious revivals, and she believed that she had been blessed to speak the truth. That's when she changed her name. Former enslaved person Sojourner Truth traveled the northern United States urging people to end the practice of slavery. A, so a sojourner is someone who travels from place to place and that's what Truth did while she spoke out against enslaving people and for women's rights. She toured the country. She challenged many people's false beliefs about race and gender. Even though she couldn't read or write, her thrilling speeches, speeches won her the respect of many educated people fighting for the rights of black people and women. And that included President Abraham Lincoln, who met her at the White House in 1864. She died on November 26, 1883. So today, we are remembering Sojourner Truth, who was a sojourner, and she spoke the truth. Amen. Amen. All right, if you are ready, let's start our worship service, our call to worship. When you're, or if you're able, stand, and we will begin our worship this morning. We trust in you, O oh God, for you are faithful. Show us your ways. Teach us your paths. We wait for you. Lead us in your paths of truth. Do not remember our failures. Out of your merciful grace, forgive us. You are faithful, O oh God. Your love is steadfast. We lift up our souls to you and praise you always. Amen. Let's pray our opening prayer this morning. God of the covenant. You are ever faithful. Your love never ends. Teach us your ways and guide us in your paths of love and forgiveness that we may witness to your grace and salvation. Amen. All right. Let's remain standing as we sing our hymn this morning, Precious Name. And uh, Heather and I were talking about the different styles of it. In the black church, we do it a different way, so we're gonna try to do it like a, uh, what is it? That's the other one. Oh, no, this is actually this, yeah, this one is like that too. Okay. Uh, yeah, I get both of them mixed up. Okay. Hey.
uh, uh, Heather, <laughs> Heather for straightening me up on that one. Let's continue our worship this morning with our prayer of illumination. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's remain standing if you're able for the scriptures. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark 1, verses 9 through 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Yes. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us all stand for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. After the day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Now here's the song I was talking about with all the different types of rhythms. So we're going to try to do this kind of with the Appalachian kind of feel to it instead of the black gospel. So I'm going to try to figure it out between those two different genres how to do this. Y'all help me out.
the, the old Appalachian would da 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 you, we kind of squish them all together. Yeah, we, we, we switch it up a little bit, all right? So next time, well, maybe next week we'll, we'll have more of the African-American uh, influence as um, the Reverend, he actually gave me the songs that he wanted to, to, for us to sing next week, so get ready. All right, so the sermon today, and you, you're probably thinking, why? Where the wild things are. Where the wild things are. Has anybody ever written or read that old book by Maurice Sendak called Where the Wild? Come on, you're the librarian, you know all yes. about it. That book was published in 1963, and it was revolutionary because it was a book that taught uh, children about feelings. And so in the book, the story focuses on this young boy named Max. And Max was a naughty boy, he was bad. He was always engaging in mischievous acts, like chasing his dog with a fork. So his mother started calling him Wild Thing. When he gets to her and gets on her nerve, she sends him to his room without supper. So one time, Max went to bed and he was in such a rage that night his bedroom turned into a jungle. He sailed to the land of the wild things where monsters with claws lived. And you know, Max wasn't afraid of anything. So what happened was that the animals, he was so wild, he was even wilder than the animals in that place that they crowned him the king of the wild things. So he was the wildest there. Um, but after a while, he got kind of lonely and he thought, I wanna go home. But the creatures, the monsters said, we don't want you to go home, stay with us. Because they were having a good time, they were having parties and doing all kinds of stuff. But he decided to go home. And as he was going, the, the wild things, the creatures, they, they really had a hard time. They pitched a fit as Max sailed away calmly home. And when he returned to his bedroom, his mother had a hot supper waiting for him. So. For Max, this jungle kind of like was, a, to me, a wilderness experience for him. And while he was away, it revealed something about himself. You know, he was met by these monsters that he called wild things, but he found out that he was the wildest of the wild things. So he learned something about himself. But it took him going away, whether it was in a dream or whatever, to realize who he really was. So I call that like a wilderness experience, okay? So the, the wilderness is not a, 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 um, something that people normally go to just for fun because the wilderness can be dangerous. And a wilderness is a land that it's described as um, largely undisturbed by modern technology or, or development. It's usually got very few roads and uh, buildings, no restaurants and modern conveniences. And most of the times the wilderness landscape is uncultivated. Um, it's unhospitable, it's not even inhabitable in some places and often very, very hostile for humans to live there. So the dangers of going to the wilderness is that you're exposed to sometimes extreme heat or extreme cold, that means, you know, uh, uh, hypothermia could happen or heat stroke and also sometimes the water sources are difficult to find in the wilderness so you might deal with dehydration and that leads to weakness and confusion and put potentially life-threatening situations so the wilderness is really not a place for a vacation you agree unless you're one of those people that likes to hang out in the wild But I, I mean, like, there's some places I won't go, but I love it in the wild. Now, the Hebrew scripture describes the wilderness in, in the Hebrew as barren. It's a 
a, a, a void place. It's a place where no life grows or no life thrives in the wilderness. It is a place, according to the Hebrew scriptures, that is cut off from life. You guys, let me know if you can't hear me because I, I heard someone say last week they're having a hard time understanding what I'm saying. So if you can't hear me, kind of raise your hand and let me know so I can let the folks back there know, okay? All right. Um, so the, the Hebrew scriptures also describes the wilderness as a place inhabited by monsters and demonic forces, a place of chaos, a place of wandering and restlessness. And of course, we know about many, many Old Testament uh, uh, characters that had intense experiences in the wilderness, beginning with Moses or even going back to Hagar and Ish Ishmael. And um, they all experienced these harrowing situations where they were drawn to the wilderness. But in the wilderness, they weren't alone because often, in most cases, God spoke to them revealed God's self to them and brought them out of the wilderness. So in our scripture today, Jesus is baptized by John. And as he comes out of the waters of the Jordan, we hear the voice saying, you are my son. And God is confirming that Jesus is the son of God. But do you know that the first order of business that Christ is given as he comes out of the water is that He's given a really difficult task. Immediately, he is driven into the wilderness, straightway by the Spirit. And he had to go to the wilderness before he launched his ministry. Since his mission was to ultimately break or dismantle the power of Satan, he had to meet him face to face in the wilderness. Amen? So it was crucial, it was very crucial for his ministry to make that journey into the wilderness, to have that one-on-one -on -one with Satan and defeat him so that we today could say, for we don't have a high priest who is not able to understand us because he was tempted. He was tempted in every single way that we are tempted. And that's from Hebrews 4.15. And Hebrews 2.18 tells us, it reminds us, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen? We are not alone in this. So Jesus stayed in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And there's that significant number that we hear throughout the scriptures, 40 days, 40 nights. And while he was in the wilderness, he laid aside his divinity. He experienced the elements of cold, of heat, of rain. He felt hunger. He maybe even felt delusional at times because of the lack of water or food. He was uncomfortable and he perspired like we do. He suffered, he struggled, but he refrained from doing the miraculous. In the wilderness, we see the humanity of Christ on display, but he endured. And I, I wonder about this situation and I may have to do a little bit more looking or digging around, but I wonder if Satan came to him one day and just got it all over, or if it was a couple of days, or if it was this constant drip, 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 drip of temptation. And I don't know, if it were me, I would say, let's get this over in one day. But we know that the enemy of our souls is not like that. We get this constant taunting of temptation over and over again. Nevertheless, he overcame. So I want to talk about today, what are the benefits of the wilderness? What are the benefits of the wilderness? The wilderness can be a place for spiritual discipline. The wilderness can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be a geographical place. It can be uh, the journey that you're in right now in your life. Uh, losing a job, 
Uh, it could be the loss of a career. It can be retirement and trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life after working for so long. It could be becoming a new parent. It could be the wilderness because it's a new experience. Um, you're venturing into uncharted territory and life is sometimes unpredictable. And it is, of course, in the wilderness. The wilderness can be a recent separation from a longtime friendship or a relationship. It, it could be a, a many, many things. The wilderness can be uh, a place of our own choosing, or it could be a place where somebody else takes us to in that relationship. Sometimes in the wilderness, God temporarily hides God's face so that we remember the joy and the peace that God's face brings us. Have you ever been in that situation when you're saying, God, where are you? I can't feel you. I can't see your face. Well, sometimes God will withdraw so that we will hunger for God in the wilderness. If God has you in the wilderness for discipline, it's out of God's love for you and it's designed to do you good in the end. So don't forsake the wilderness experiences. Don't loathe them. Number two, the wilderness can be a place of testing and refining preceding a season of fruitfulness. Have you ever been there where you're up on the mountain and everything is going good and all of a sudden crash, everything goes down and you're in the wilderness? after being up for so long. The wilderness can be a place where your life skills are sharpened through uh, the pain and the disorientation. You can grow and mature. The wilderness may come at the heel of a season of success to remind us that we did not get where we arrived in our own strength. It was with the help of God that we succeeded. The wilderness causes us to look inward and to reflect on our own lives. And don't assume that you're in the wilderness because God is done with you. And a lot of people do. They think just because I'm going through this trial, God must be done with me. No, that's not the case. It might be the very place that God is refining and purging and pruning and equipping and training you for something really significant. So God is not done with you when you go through trials, amen? The wilderness is a place where God wins back our affection and crushes our idols. Oh boy, what about that? We all have things that we worship and uh, you know adore, sometimes more than God. In the wilderness, distractions, all of our distractions are removed and space is provided to experience the goodness of God. The wilderness becomes an oasis as God is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer and everything else is stripped away. When we are forced to turn and look at God, we find that we have been looking for him all along. That's when all the other stuff is stripped away, in the quiet, in the silence. In the quietness and the seclusion and desperation of being here, God draws near, takes care of us, and satisfies us with God's love. God might have had enough of us, and I get it, flirting with our idols. <laughs> It's like, I'm done with this, y'all. I'm going to take you to the wilderness where God can woo our affections to God so that we will fall away from whatever is trapping us, bringing us to our knees. And that is the place where we retire our small gods, amen, and worship the one and only true God. And I'm saying this to myself. I have things that often I place before God and I'm saying, okay, God, um, you're powerful, you are. I don't really need this, all right? The wilderness can be a place where God makes God's glory clear and compelling. God might intend to take 
me or you into the wilderness so that you can become awed and amazed by what God can do. The wilderness is where we are stripped of our systems of belief about God. And when you're in that presence of God, the fullness of God, the miracles of God, the, the things that God does, it, it, you know, he corrects our stinking thinking, I guess you want to call it. Because a lot of us, we grew up with really strange and weird uh, ideas about who God is. But when you bathe yourself in the presence of God, those things get stripped away in the presence of God. So it's very, very important to spend time alone with God so that God can take away even those misconceptions about who God is. God, we say, let me see you clearly. And God wants to build our trust and increase our faith, but sometimes it takes experiencing the wilderness in order to know God. Remember that your time in the wilderness is never wasted. Trust that while you're in the wilderness, that it's not going to last forever. You're not going to be there forever. The drought is there, but eventually it's going to give way to refreshing rain. And God is leading, and God's purpose will come. But waiting is hard. But God promises that there is grace in the wilderness. The wilderness compels us sometimes to refrain from eating like Jesus did. Biblical fasting, that is one of the spiritual disciplines, and it's something, especially during this Lenten season, that a lot of people engage in, but there's something about it. It, it really helps to draw you closer to God. And solitude, it can be a gift. In solitude, we get to know God, and we get to know ourselves. It can be refreshing, it can spark creativity, and even help us to appreciate our friends and family even better, amen? I remember uh, when my kids were small, I had this regular thing that I would do every quarter. I would leave my family and go to a hotel and spend three or four days all alone. And usually that was at a point where I was done with everybody. <laughs> It's like, I'm tired of you guys. I'm getting out of here. And you would, not, you would be surprised at how a lot of people don't realize that when you spend time away from your children or your family members, is there something about being refreshed and revived? You come back where your, your love bucket is fuller. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I have clients that I see in my therapy office I see the strange looks on people's faces. Sometimes it's, <laughs> it is wonderful and refreshing to get away from them. And I'm not saying that, you know, they were toddlers. I didn't do that when I was nursing or anything. But again, you might have thought that, no, I didn't do that when they were that little. But when they were older and, you know, as a mother, I was staying home and I was cooking and cleaning and all this kind of stuff. And you get overwhelmed and working. So I took a break, and, and, and even the bishop talked about that. We um, had a couple of hours with the bishop. She said that, and she encouraged us to invite the members of our churches to have a Sabbath every week. She said, we have gotten away from a Sabbath. So Bishop, every Friday is her Sabbath. She said she does no church work. She works, I think, the first few days of the week and gets all of her work done, and she winds down by Thursday. And on Sat Friday, she does nothing, or she does whatever she feels. And she kind of joked about it. She said, there's some days where she just go to Home Depot and just walk around in the, the aisle where the lumber is or the, the nuts and bolts. And that's what she does on her Sabbath. There is a reason why God gives us a Sabbath. We need that rest. We need the time away. We need the time to reflect on what our week has been like, you know, uh, what we need to discard from our lives. Are there new habits and new things that we need to pick up? But that Sabbath is important. In all of my life, I mean, I have never, I don't let people take that time from me. 
I would be in, more insane than I am if I didn't. <laughs> okay. I take those times. And I'm telling you, I go to the beach at least two, three times a week, okay? <clears throat> no, really. That is so important. We work, we work, we work, we work, and die 20, 10 years earlier because we work so hard, and a lot of people never get to enjoy their retirement because they're so sick from working all that time. Life is not supposed to be like that. If we take our Sabbath, we take our rest, you, you can prolong your life if you do that. God never meant for us to work ourselves to the grave. <laughs> That's not life. That's not living life, okay? That's, I chased that rabbit for a little bit. Okay, so solitude. So the season of Lent is here. We are four days into the journey. And there are some wilderness journeys that God, I believe, is calling each and every one of us to engage in. So I want you to start thinking about some of the things that you would like to encounter during this 40, less than 40 days. I have another little story about another little boy named Max. So this is from Max Lucado's book, God Never Gives Up On You. So he writes the story about his grandson, Max. In this story, he explains the grace of God during this kind of a wilderness journey that his grandson takes. So Max Lucado and his wife, they're enjoying their afternoon at home when all of a sudden they hear something Someone said, help, help, it's an emergency. He knew the voice because it was his granddaughter, Rosie. So she was about one month shy of six years old, redheaded, blue eyed. And in that moment, she sounded very urgent. Rosie and her three year old brother, Max Wesley, they were engaged in their favorite pastime, which was rock collecting. No need to spend money on these two for toys because they were just as happy playing in the backyard, collecting rocks in the open field. So they hurried to the back door, crying, what happened? Rosie said, Max, Max can't stand up. Max replied, well, why can't he stand up? She said he loaded rocks in his pockets. His pants fell down to his ankles and he's stuck and can't get up. Max's wife said, this looks like a sermon illustration here. And she was right. It was an illustration deluxe. Little Max could not stand up. He was plopped on the path. His knees were drawn to his chest. His jeans were down to his ankle. And the only thing separating his rear from the asphalt was his spiderwear underwear. Spider-Man underwear. Max says to his grandson, can you get up? His voice was small and forlorn. No. He said, can you try to get up? And when he did, the problem was all too clear. Each pocket was laden with rocks, side pockets, rear pockets, all four pockets were heavy with stones. Do you need help? Grandpa said. He said, yes. He let me remove the unnecessary load one by one, rock by rock, weight by weight. Next thing you know, he hitched up his jeans and started to play all over again. Little Max Wesley was in a wilderness all his own. He was burdened. He was laden by rocks in his pocket. He had fallen to the ground. He felt help helpless. His sister was there to assist him and comfort him like the angels. His grandfather and grandmother ran to the backyard or to the desert or to the wilderness to help him in this crisis that seemed small to us, but it was a big crisis to him and a frightening one. And I imagine that he learned some things about putting too many rocks in his pocket. Maybe that, you know, you don't carry more rocks than you can carry, all right, in the wilderness. He also probably learned that even in that hard situation that he was in, that somebody was gonna to come to help him, that God would help him, and that he's never alone. One more thing, while we're in the wilderness, and we're in these wilderness experiences, don't forget the word of God. 
or the words of God. Don't forget the words of God. The scriptures and the revealed word of God in the wilderness, the scripture is what kept Jesus from temptation. If you remember, when he was tempted to bow down to Satan, he responded in Deuteronomy from Deuteronomy 6.13. When he was tempted to put God to the test, he responded by scripture. The wilderness is meant to shape us. It, it's meant to, 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 to take us or make us into the image of God, the imago Dei. So allow the spirit to lead you, each and every one of you, into the wilderness. Don't be afraid of the wilderness. Allow the spirit to lead you. Allow yourself to be exposed to the elements of heat, the elements of cold, the rain, the windfall. Don't be afraid of the dark, you know, because, you know, we have this image of darkness as fearful, but we know with God there's no difference. He doesn't differentiate between light and darkness. It's all the same to God. So he says, don't fear the night, because to God, night and day are the same. And one more thing, there is not a mention in this scripture that I have seen of God turning God's face away from Christ when he was in the wilderness. The one time it did happen was when? Hallelujah, when he was on the cross. So that lets me know that when I'm going through something, when I'm in a wilderness situation, that I'll never have to worry about God turning away from me. Okay, that's the kind of God God is. It doesn't matter. You know, we often put labels and gradations on sin and suffering, but no, whatever you're going through, God will not turn away from you. And we have the added blessing of angels. Hmm. <laughs> we don't talk about that very much. Jesus had them. Why not us? You know, when we were children, we prayed, didn't we? About angels. What was that prayer we prayed before we went to bed at night? Now I lay me down to sleep. What was your what was yours? Okay. If I should die before I wake. What's the rest of it? I pray the Lord my soul to take. But there was there was another one that I heard one time where you prayed about the angels uh, that would be in your room or something at night before you went to sleep. But we don't, as adults, we leave all, we forget about all that. Right? So Jesus had angels. I didn't either too. I know. So God's gonna walk with you in the wilderness. You'll be accompanied by angels. No trial too deep. No wilderness too crazy that God won't be with us. Amen. Let us stand for our final hymn. Jesus walked that lonesome valley to 112. to stay.
left, 36 days left to Lent. Consider your valley, your wilderness. What will you if, if even you know remove from your life or sacrifice during this time to draw closer to your God? It's not a big ask, I don't think. If you want to, there are places online where you can actually go and they'll show you like 40 different things that you can think about. And um, yeah, let's just do this, okay? Let's all bow in prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for this season where you are calling us to look inward and to look upward. We thank you that we have an opportunity to reset, to recalibrate our lives. And I pray that as we go through our valleys, through our wilderness journeys, that we would come out on the other side bright, glowing with the help of the Holy Spirit and your guiding angels. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. See y'all next week. Got a meeting Thursday. Yeah. And shake some hands on the way out. Elbows. <laughs> Thank you, Heather.